Dear students, with this lecture, I continue the general overview on the autonomic nervous system. As you remember, in the previous lecture, I gave a general description on the structure of the autonomic nervous system and started describing the sympathetic part of it. The last topic I talked about was the cervical part of the sympathetic trunk. Uh, now I will continue the uh, description of the sympathetic trunk and starting with the thoracic part. As you remember, the sympathetic trunk consists of a series of ganglia and between them connections. Uh, the uh, whole system receives information from the spinal nerve. In this case, the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve is the same as the intercostal nerve. And with the wide communicating branches, the ramus communicans albus, uh, the uh, information is received there. Whenever the information entered this system, just a few fibers uh, will contact these uh, nerve cells, make a synapses, and these cells, the axon of these cells, immediately leave the system through the gray communicating branches, joining the intercostal arteries. Most of the pregoing fibers running up and down in the system, uh, the up running. Uh, the fibers going up to the cervical part of the tympanic trunk, as I described before. The lower part, especially, especially in the lumbar region, they go down to the sacral part. And a couple of fibers uh, join, uh, just ganging up to nerves, they go medially for the unpaired ganglia of the sympathetic system in the abdomen. These fibers, which go medially, aiming at the unpaired ganglia, especially the celiac ganglion, is named nervus splanchnicus, the splanchnic nerve. Once again, these are all preganglionic fibers and aiming at the ganglion. The uh, gray communicating branches I mentioned immediately leave, so they do not go up and down, and uh, they, they join the artery. Mostly they supply the uh, muscular wall of the artery. Uh, in, in this way, they control the blood supply of the area but also innervate the sweat gland and the musculus erector pili. In the lumbar region, the structure of the sympathetic trunk is very similar, a ganglion chain, and interconnected with preganglionic fibers. They also receive the white communicating branches, the preganglionic fibers, from the ventral rami of the lumbar spinal nerve, and the postganglionic fibers running up and uh, down, and partially medially. Those fibers which run medially, uh, these named the lumbal splanchnic nerve, there is splanchnic lumbalis. Many of the books doesn't contain this expression, so try to uh, remember that. And uh, uh, these will feed the uh, superior and the inferior uh, mesenteric ganglia. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, this lumbar part, the uh, postgonglic fibers, which is equivalent to the ramus communicans grisos in the thoracic part, mostly join the aorta, which is nearby, and in the wall of the aorta, they make the, a kind of rich network and continues on all the branch system of the abdominal aorta. This, uh, uh, this is why they control the blood supply of the lower part of the body, especially in the lower limb. Uh, there's a medical uh, uh, therapeutic measure that removing the entire lumbal uh, part of the sympathetic trunk with this name, the sympathectomy. This is done in patients where the circulation of the lower limb is very bad. They hardly get the blood of the lower limb. And when the sympathetic trunk is removed, there are little uh, uh, tension a little activity of the sympathetic trunk will be eliminated and there's still a small dilatation of the artery. But unfortunately, this just can postpone a couple, a couple of months of the complete removal of the limb. Uh, we have a, a pair of ganglia around the level of the kidney. Usually, it's a little bit enlarged second lumbar part of the uh, uh, sympathetic trunk, sometimes uh, separate, we have separate ganglion. This is what we named the aortic or renal ganglion. And beside the kidney, the gonads, the arteries of which uh, are coming out of the aorta in a similar way, are uh, controlled by that, especially the blood supply of these organs. Uh, 
Uh, the sacral area, as I as you mentioned, the lowermost white communicating branch, or the most autonomic nucleus, is at the middle part of the lumbar area. So they get the preconging fibers through the sympathetic trunk from up. The postganglic fibers join mostly the branch system of the internal ilia, and this way they uh, participating in the first, especially the posterior part of the lower limb, and the uh, first of all the pelvic uh, organs. This was the uh, summary, brief summary on the sympathetic trunk. Now let's see the other sympathetic ganglia in our body. First of all, we have three uh, unpaired ganglia, which what they name prevertebral ganglia. These are attached to the unpaired uh, uh, visceral branches of the abdominal aorta. Uh, the uppermost one is the biggest one. This is the celiac trunk. And we have the biggest ganglion in the abdomen, the celiac ganglion. Celiac ganglion is uh, sometimes considered to be the brain of the abdomen. And really, if you have a special hit on the abdomen, usually this ganglion uh, suspends its activity for a short period of time because it controls the blood supply of the uh, uh, guts. Uh, the released artery picks up more blood, do not get blood for the brain, and you become unconscious. This is the uh, mechanism, how a strong hitting in a certain part of the abdomen can make people unconscious. Uh, this, uh, uh, the postgangling fiber, of course, they join the uh, uh, branches of the celiac trunk, and they uh, uh, control the blood supply of all of those organs which are supplied by the celiac trunk. And if you uh, think about them in an embryologic way of thinking, the derivatives of the foregut belong to this group. Uh, the superior mesenteric ganglion, gondium mesenterical superior, similarly is around the origin of the superior mesenteric uh, uh, artery. And uh, uh, whatever is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, uh, the control of the blood supply is done by, uh, via this ganglion. Uh, the inferior mesenteric uh, ganglion is uh, similarly around the inferior mesenteric artery. And uh, sorry, this is a mistake. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, it supplies the branches and those organs, the blood supply of those organs, which are uh, uh, supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery with embryologic way of thinking is the hindgut derivatives. There is one more pair of ganglion, and this is the medulla of the adrenal gland. The medulla of the adrenal gland consists of very unique cells. They pretty much look like nerve cells. They have a uh, uh, bluish cytoplasm, very active nucleus, very huge nucleus, very uh, diffuse chromatin with a very, very visible nucleus, look like nerve cells. And look like they look like nerve cells because they are nerve cells. They are apolar neurons. They have all the features of a neurons, but they do not have processes. Uh, the preganglionic fibers reach them in the, from the sympathetic system, similar to the, uh, practically they belong to the lumbar sprouting nerve, and then uh, as a response they produce the neurotransmitter of the sympathetic system, norepinephrine, and because they do not have axon, do not send it far away, but they empty nearby, and these large capillaries, the sinusoids, pick them up, and practically this way they increase the norepinephrine level of the blood. So this is a kind of combination of neural tissue and endocrine tissue, but technically this is neural tissue. This is a ganglion made of apolar neurons. Okay, that's about the sympathetic system, the most important uh, features. And let's summarize the parasympathetic system, the second type of the autonomic nervous system. As I mentioned, the sympathetic nervous system is activated whenever our environment is very busy, very active. So all those organs which must get a, uh, a very quick noticing what's happening and a very quick response to this environment become activated. The parasympathetic nervous system is just the opposite. It is active where our environment is calm where we're feeling good, we have no problem. And so this is the uh, system of the well-being. 
The two major functions belong to this, this digestion and the reproductive function. Uh, whenever uh, we are under stress, we, uh, we don't really want to make love. Uh, the uh, function, whatever is belong to the parasympathetic system, is the motility of the guts or intestinal things in general. The secretion, this is the content rich secretion with enzymes and whatever. It makes the sphincters loose and increases the blood flow in the genitalia. Uh, what is the morphology of the system? The center, as I mentioned, and the supranuclear pathway is the same for with the, as with the uh, sympathetic system. So the uh, hypothalamus and the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. The nuclei are in different location. Uh, these are uh, in the brainstem, and these are in the sacral spine uh, or the spinal cord. As you remember, the sympathetic system was in the thoracolumbar part of the spinal cord, no further up, no further down. But the parasympathetic system is divided into two groups, partially in the brainstem and partially in the sacral part of the spinal cord, similarly to the sympathetic, it's the lateral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord. The preganglion fibers depends. In the uh, uh, cranial parasympathetic, the, uh, of course, the preganglion fibers live with the, a couple of cranial nerves. Uh, in the sacral part, uh, they uh, come out and this nerve, which is made of the preganglion fibers, is named the pelvic nerve, nervic pericus. The ganglia also differs. In the head, we have separate dissectable ganglia, what I will describe soon in details. And below the clavicule, all the ganglia is located within the wall of the uh, organs. One of the best known by you is the uh, myenteric plexus in the wall of the guts. The postganglion fibers also depends on the location. Uh, as you remember, the postganglion fibers of the autonomic nervous system has Schwann only sheath, which is very fragile, very sensitive mechanically. They do not have this type of several turn of membrane which makes, uh, make, make them stronger. So this is why it cannot live without any support. As you remember, the sympathetic postganglion fibers are uh, travel in the wall of the uh, arteries, which makes a very strong support for them. The cranial parasympathetic, uh, the postgranial fibers is typically go to the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve give a lift for them, and they're traveling to the target, the digeminal nerve. Because the tri trigeminal nerve goes everywhere in the head, and they have a good, a good way to find the appropriate uh, carrier. Uh, Below the uh, clavicule, all the, uh, because the, all of the ganglia is in within the wall of the organ, the postgranial fibers is already protected. They will run inside the wall of the organs. Uh, here is an example of the uh, in a uh, gut wall you saw in the second semester with the nictic oxide enzyme localization. And the transmitter of all of the postgranglion fibers of the parasympathetic system is acetylcholine. So in this case, not only the pre, but also the postgranglion fibers has acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. Now, let's see some details. Let's start with details on the cranial parasympathetic system. The first is the nucleus, Edingel-Westphal nucleus, which is uh, the official name is the accessory oculomotoric nucleus. As you know, they are working with the control of the intrinsic muscles of the eye, as you studied in the previous weeks in histology, and also in, in the lecture. Uh, the, uh, of course, the preganglion fibers live with the oculomotor nerve. Here you can see uh, this is the uh, uh, cavernous sinus through which the eye-moving nerves, the oculomotoric, the trochlear, and the abducens pass through, and uh, we, the oculomotoric nerve with the uh, preganglion fibers enter the orbit. Inside the orbit, uh, the, the preganglion fibers, well, the, the uh, original fibers of the oculomotoric go to the muscles and innervate the muscles, but the preganglion fibers leave and entering a ganglion, what we named the ciliary ganglion, ganglion ciliare, and here it has the synapses. The postganglion fibers, as obeying a rule, always join the nearby 
uh, trigeminal branch. In this case, whatever they going in the direction they want to inside the eye are the short ciliary uh, nerves, nearly ciliary brevis, and together with these uh, sensory fibers, they go to the target. They have two targets. One is the sphincter pupillae, which is the uh, effector of the light reflex and also the ciliary muscle which uh, uh, gives uh, changes the shape of the lens and this is why it uh, controls the accommodation the, the changing the focal distance of the eye lens the second uh, parasympathetic nucleus in the brainstem is the superior salivatory nucleus and the pregoning fibers live with the fascial nerve uh, the uh, fascial nerve, if you see a little summary, the primary fibers are the somatomotoric, but they have visceromotoric and the viscerosensory, actually taste sensory fibers, no somatosensory fibers. Uh, the fascial nerve enters the internal acoustic meatus and goes through the fascial canal, what you uh, know well from the first semester uh, study when you studied the skull and also repeated this year. Uh, the uh, uh, fascial nerve, the fascial canal has two turns. Uh, this one is very sharp. This is what we name the external knee. And we have a posterior one, which is a borderline between the upper and the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity. During this way, inside the petrous bone, the, there are two ways where the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers live. One is at this knee. This is the greater petrosal nerve and one is just before it leaving the stylomastoid foramen, this is the corda tympani. Whenever the uh, fascial nerve leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen, only somatomotoric fibers are in. Uh, it's worth mentioning that in the external knee of the fascial nerve, we have the geniculate ganglion. And the geniculate ganglion is not an autonomic ganglion. It's a sensory ganglion, the pseudo cells. These are the taste sensory, uh, uh, sensory ganglion cells. The greater petrosal nerve has no, not, no functional relation with the geniculate ganglion, just a topography where it lives. When the greater petrosal nerve uh, leaves, it uh, leaves to the foramen lacerum, it passes through the pterygoid canal and enters the pterygoid palatine fossa and it gives preganglion fibers to the pterygopalatine ganglion. Uh, the pterygopalatine ganglion, obeying the rule as just mentioned, the postganglion fibers join the uh, branches of the tri nearby trigeminal nerves and because the maxillary nerve, the main body of the maxillary nerve, is just enters the pterygopalatine ganglion, and all the branches are distributed in that. They have a good way to go for several uh, direction. Uh, the uh, the first from the pterygopalatine ganglion, they join the. Uh, a zygomatic nerve. With the zygomatic nerve, it enters the orbit. The preganglion fibers soon leave the zygomatic nerve and joins another nerve, other uh, trigeminal branch, a branch of the ophthalmic nerve. This is what we name the lacrimal nerve. This is the communicating branch between the zygomatic and the lacrimal nerve. And this nerve, and through this uh, lacrimal nerve, which is primarily a sensory nerve, this guest uh, fibers go to the lacrimal gland and innervating that. Uh, the other two output of the uh, trigopalatine ganglions are the sphenopalatine foramen through which the spelopalatine nerve goes. The primary function of the nerve is to give sensory supply for the nasal cavity, the posterior lower part of the nasal cavity and the guest fibers, the parasympathetic guest fibers go together and supplies all of the uh, salivary glands in the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity. Finally, the third output of the pterygopalatine ganglion is the uh, uh, greater and lesser palatine foramen uh, through which the, the, uh, the pregoglion fibers leave and supply the salivary glands in the uh, um, uh, palate, both the heart and the self-palate, the mucous membrane, of course. 
The second uh, outgoing fibers from the fascial canal is the chorda tympani, which goes to the lateral wall of the tympanic cavity, passes through the tympanic membrane, this is why it gets its name, and then the, uh, leaves the skull through the uh, petrotympanic fissure. After it leaving the, the skull, uh, they define the uh, lingual nerve. Interestingly enough, this way even the preganglion fibers go with the trigeminal branch. And below the mandibule, these preganglion fibers leave the lingual nerve and will be processed inside a ganglion. They name this submandibular ganglion. The postganglion fibers partially go to the nearby submandibular gland. The rest of them goes back to the lingual nerve, and together with the lingual nerve goes forward, and it will supply the sublingual uh, gland and also the glands of the back of the tongue. Uh, the, uh, this was the story of the superior salivary nucleus. Let's go to the next one, the inferior salivatory nucleus. The pregonglion fibers of the inferior, inferior salivatory nucleus live with the glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve, whenever it leaves through the jugular foramen, it, we have a fossa, the fossula petrosa, in which, by the way, sensory ganglion of the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve is sitting, but just on the bottom of the uh, uh, fossula petrosa, we have a little canal named tympanic canal, and the branch of the uh, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve goes there, and these are preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. This named the tympanic nerve. This tympanic nerve goes back to the tympanic cavity and in the mandibular wall of the promontorium they make a network. Interestingly enough, this network of the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers picking up postganglionic sympathetic fibers from the adventitia of the carotid artery, which is just nearby, through the carotid carotico-tympanici, and these two nerves join and leave at the roof, at the top of the tympanic cavity, and this nerve is named the lesser petrosal nerve, nervus uh, petrosus minor. Once again, it contains preganglionic parasympathetic and postganglionic sympathetic fibers. Uh, whenever uh, they leave, they enter a ganglion just located in front of the external ear canal, the otic ganglion. This is why it's got name. Otos, as you know, is Greek for ear. And first, when it was discovered, they thought that something to do with the ear, but later on figured out, but for tradition, that, that name remained. Uh, also, uh, just the same story, the postgonglion fibers must find an appropriate nerve, appropriate branch of the trigeminal nerve to go to the target, because they target the parotid gland, they have a very good carrier, and this is the auriculotemporal nerve. As you know, the auriculotemporal nerve goes, uh, passes through the parotid gland, and it goes up uh, in front of the ear to so make a sensory supply of the temporal region. So, because they're passing through the parotid gland, the postgonglion fibers have a very good carrier in that, and during the way, they're passing through the parotid gland, step by step they leave the auriculotemporal nerve and innervate the parotid gland. By the time that the auricular nerve leaves the parotid gland, only sensory fibers remain. Uh, not all the, the parasympathetic preganglion fibers go to the tympanic nerve, but many of them remain in the body of the glossopharyngeal nerve. And that's make a very strange thing. Where are the ganglia? And these are so-called microscopic ganglia inside the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. What does it mean? If you make a histological slide on the glossopharyngeal nerve, that part which is feeding the uh, pharynx, beside the normal expected peripheral nerve, we have a lot of nerve cells. So this is a combination of ganglion and peripheral nerve. And uh, uh, they supply that area, which is the target of the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. The target of the glossopharyngeal nerve is the naso and oropharynx. It does, the glossopharyngeal nerve itself is thus full service for that. It innervates the skeletal muscle, it makes a somatosensory innervation, it uh, innervates the few 
taste the butts, which are still present on the, especially on the mesopharynx, and all the glands, which are located in the epi and the mesopharynx, the nasal and the oropharynx, will be supplied by that. And for the gland supply, the microscopic ganglia inside the body of the glossopharyngeal nerve is. Uh, that supplies the, uh, once again, the glands of the oropharynx and the nasopharynx and the large number of glands inside the root of the tongue. Because the root of the tongue is facing the oropharynx, this is also considered logically to belong to this system. Finally, the last uh, nucleus is the biggest one. This is the nucleus alet cinerei medialis, also named the dorsal vagal nucleus. If you hear these two expressions, these refer to the same nucleus, just with two different names. The preganglion fibers uh, leave uh, most of them with the uh, uh, vagus, and the many fibers also leave with the accessory nerve. Whenever the accessory nerve leaves the brain, it contains a lot of uh, parasympathetic fibers. And this is why, logically, it's considered one of the branchial nerves, uh, the nerve from the branchial arches. However, all of the fibers which is leaving uh, with the accessory nerve, the, uh, these fibers, all, uh, whenever it leaves through the jugular foramen, uh, no, uh, yeah, jugular foramen for the skull, only the somatomotoric fibers left in the, ac uh, in the uh, accessory nerve. The visceromotoric fibers and visceral uh, sensory fibers join the vagus. So whenever these nerves leave the skull, only the uh, vagus contains the pregnant fibers coming from the dorsal nucleus of the vagus. And the vagus is a very long nerve and a lot, lot of things. Most of the fibers are uh, autonomic uh, motoric fibers. So they, they supply the glands in the, uh, the hypopharynx, the laryngopharynx. Also, it controls the sinoatrial node, uh, making the pace, uh, modifying the pacemaker of the heart, the glands of the airways, and uh, all of the uh, areas of the the gastrointestinal tract till the left colic flexure. This way, it's uh, easy to understand that the vagus is the longest nerve. It can be five meter long. If you consider it goes all along the wall of the small intestine, it's not really difficult to imagine. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ganglia, as I mentioned before, is located in the wall of the organs and the postganglial fibers also. The pelvic parasympathetic so the parasympathetic uh, autonomic nucleus in the lateral horn of the sacral spinal nerve, they live with the, the uh, pigling fibers as a, a pelvic nerve, and they enter the organs. And similarly, as uh, for the vagus, the ganglia is built in into the organs, whatever pelvic organs we have. The hindgut derivatives, the genitalia, the urinary bladder, controlled by this system. This was the story of the parasympathetic system. Just a few years, quite a few years ago, it was discovered that the, beside the classic sympathetic and parasympathetic system, we have a separate third part of the autonomic system, which many times distinct for them. Traditionally, it's considered to be the part of the parasympathetic system, but especially be, be after the nitric oxide as a neurotransmitter was discovered, uh, they realized that this is a, we meet a, came across a different system. And this is what we named the enteral system. The enteral nervous system is the most ancient nervous system of the body. When a couple of milliard years ago, we lived in a sea in a form as a sack like creature. And the only thing which it can do, some kind of muscle was there, and pump the water in and out just to make fresh water coming in with fresh food for digestion. This was done, this rhythmic contraction was done by a series uh, uh, of nerve cells, uh, very well organized, and doing this kind of rhythmic function. And this nerve cells inherited from milliard years ago still there, and this is located in our gut. They have a very big 
autonomy. So if they left alone, nobody disturbed them, especially not the vagus, they can very nicely do the peristaltic movement. What does it mean? If there is a content inside with a very well organized series of contraction, they move downwards the content. This is what we name the peristaltic movement. So peristaltic movement is a well organized uh, uh, inbuilt feature of this myenteric plexus. And the, uh, actually the stimulation, the initiation is done by the stretch receptors of the gut. And nothing else is required for a nice movement of the gut. The, uh, the vagus can be considered in this uh, mechanism as an alien army who uh, actually forced modifying this, the activity of this. Uh, practically, not really good uh, use of uh, this we have. Uh, uh, the uh, whole uh, gut, whole gut system works very nice without any kind of external influence, but maybe more harm than advantages. For instance, due to the vagus interference, we think that before the exam, if we are nervous, we can vomit or we can have diarrhea. So this is the kind of uh, the uh, so, uh, psychological influence uh, gets on the gut. Otherwise. Probably nobody knows any kind of advantage of that, but this life, the vagus, influences it. Uh, this uh, myenteric plexus and the submucous plexus practically are the components of the enteral system. And the common feature of them that unlike the parasympathetic system, which is, uh, has neurotransmitters acetylcholine, the neurotransmitters of the system is nitric oxide, not acetylcholine and also different things, and the Auerbach, the meanteric and the submucous plexus are the members of them. And you, you could probably very well remember from the previous semester's uh, slide, in which uh, this is the histochemical reaction with the nitric oxide synthase enzyme uh, histochemical reaction showing these components. Uh, there is a uh, development of malformation, which related to this system, is the so-called Hirsprung disease. It means that periodically, in a certain area, these nerve cells are missing, simply do not develop. The consequence of that is that the dead part of the gut cannot move. So whenever something enters there, stays there, it's getting larger and larger, it cannot push it furthermore. And this way, it is a poor baby, this Hirschsprung disease, that the large areas are extended guts with content from which the gut cannot get rid of it because in lack of neural cells. Uh, relatively easy to uh, cure this one, but it requires surgery because usually it extends to shorter segments of the gut, especially the large intestine, if you surgically remove that, we cannot do anything else, then the patient can live a normal life. Uh, this was the uh, anatomy of the autonomic nervous system. Let's just have a few thoughts uh, of the clinical relation of the autonomic nervous system. So the function, primary function of the autonomic nervous system is to uh, ensure a homeostasis. So keep a body temperature, blood pressure, the concentration of various chemicals and so on in the body. And they work independent of the uh, somatic system, whatever we are aware of it, whatever we can voluntarily do. However, there are several crosstalks between these two systems, which has uh, a kind of pathological consideration or kind of medical consideration. The crosstalk between these two systems can be in two ways can be a crosstalk between the autonomic and the somatic system, which is mostly useful. At the autonomic nerve, if our internal organ is damaged, it gets pain signal, but because it belongs to the autonomic system, we are not officially aware of that. But because there is a crosstalk, I will give the details on, uh, in the later lecture on the pain processing, they, uh, the tr uh, transfer of the signal to the somatic pain system and we feel pain, not where the organ is, but where the innervation, where the signal arrives at the, at the spinal cord. And this is what we named the head zones. So this is an autonomic somatic type of cross talk. There is also a different type. The somatic system also can modify the autonomic system. 
especially when we are under stress, we have problems, psychological problems, then the over uh, activity of our cortex can modify the autonomic nervous system and this makes usually non-wanted uh, result. Uh, especially the stress, acute or chronic stress can modify it. There are some organs which are specially sensitive to this cross stroke, especially sensitive to the target of this cross stroke. These are the heart, the kidney, and the blood pressure. So we have uh, uh, not only feeling, but actual act on the heart, actual head of the blood pressure, and also in the kidney. And this is why uh, one of the reasons why we must solve this stress, otherwise these uh, uh, organs can really damage the mechanism of the damage is they act on the sympathetic system, they will shrink, reduce the blood supply, and this is why we get heart attack uh, or stroke or whatever. Uh, these people who are uh, sensitive to this one, the kind of stress, have two, belong to two groups. One of them, whenever they are under stress, the sympathetic system is uh, uh, activated. This is what we name the sympathicotonic patient. This uh, patient, these people can be uh, recognized because they are under stress, they become aggressive, and uh, they, are, they are crying out and hitting. And the internal, those organs become activated and damaged, which is controlled by the sympathetic system, so they die of stroke or heart attack or high blood pressure. In the opposite, some people, whenever they are under stress, not the sympathetic, but the parasympathetic system are activated. Uh, this is the, the parasympathetic otomy. These are typically they introducing itself. They, you hardly can recognize that, but they really have a fear, a stress, and they parasympathetic system activated. These results, these people are vomiting, have diarrhea, and they usually die of stomach ulcer or stomach uh, uh, cancer. Uh, these uh, uh, or, uh, these uh, uh, pathological conditions, unfortunately, is relatively frequent, but it's very difficult to, to treat. All of the symptoms whatever comes from this uh, misworking uh, uh, of this uh, uh, autonomic system has symptoms which are identical to real problems of this particular organ. So if we find a patient something like this, very important, very carefully, we have to check whether the problem has biological background, whether really these organs are bad, or they have just control problem, psychological problem, coming the information from the somatic to the autonomic system, and treating this way. So if a patient comes frequently that, uh, that I, ha I feel stomach, or I, I feel palpitation of my heart, do not send away like hysterical, because they can die of that. Even if they are... Uh, really have only psychological problems of, the, of these symptoms, you have to take it seriously because even without any functional morphological problem with these organs, the stress can kill the organs and can kill the patient. So this is why if you came across a patient something which has a suspect of kind of somato, psychosomatic uh, problem, number one, you have to very carefully check whether it does have a kind of organic problem. If not, take care of a kind of uh, psychological treatment, uh, otherwise you can lose the patient. Uh, practically, this is what I wanted to talk about today, and with this one I finished the short overview on the autonomic nervous system. Thank you very much for your attention.